Hey guys, welcome back to another Milk Fan Reacts video with me, Draven. Thank you so much again for tuning in. I've been doing a lot of different videos this past week, and I promised you guys every Saturday and Sunday will be a Sabaton History React video. And since their most recent uploads was Aces in Exile, they did two parts to it. So it makes perfect sense to do part one today for Saturday and part two on Sunday. So without further ado, let's jump into the Sabaton History reaction of Aces in Exile, part one of Sabaton History Channel. The Battle of Britain was fought in the skies above Britain by the British and the Germans. And a lot of other nations. Yeah, that's what this is about today. I love the chemistry of the host. He's got a lot of good insight. I love that they include the song into it. It helps break that up, breaks up like the it's spring just of 1940. It seemed the German Wehrmacht sweep through the Low Countries in France with unexpected speed and ferocity. No one in Britain had expected France to fall so quickly, and the British forces had barely escaped back over the Channel in time. Unrelated, um, wanted to. One thing I always like, I don't want to say appreciated, but one thing that Hitler was not so much known for was his appreciation of art and he loved the Eiffel Tower so a lot of the time especially in you know in the Middle East and in the earlier part of um, like the Asian empires and all of that they would destroy the uh, country that they occupied they would destroy their monuments and stuff like that so I was kind of shocked to think that Hitler didn't destroy the Eiffel Tower because he liked it. it. It's weird. I don't know. But anytime I see him in front of the Eiffel Tower, I forget that he's there because he's appreciating the Eiffel Tower. It's really weird. I always thought that was like a really surreal, it's like surreal feeling to know that he's appreciating art, but he's just like evil dictator dude. I don't know. But anyways. By the end of June 1940, it seemed to many that Great Britain stood alone. And if they chose to keep fighting, they might face invasion or starvation. But Britain also found itself unexpected allies. As much of Europe came under Nazi rule, not only did the now exiled governments of six European nations seek refuge in Britain, but they also brought thousands of their soldiers, pilots, and air crews. The defense of Britain relied on its air force. Should the Royal Air Force be defeated, then even the powerful Royal Navy would sooner or later succumb to German air superiority. The British had, in fact, lost quite a few pilots during the evacuation from the continent, and the coming battle for Britain would be fought on a knife's edge. So it, it seemed like a perfect match, you know? A host of experienced pilots and crewmen, far away from their country but with the desire to fight, and a country in dire need of reinforcements. The British and the foreign governments came to the same conclusion. However, it's one thing to have a pool of new pilots and another thing to unite them into an actual fighting force. A common enemy and the ability to fly a plane was simply not enough. First, the British government had to create many political necessities from scratch to legitimate the presence of foreign forces on their soil. The first step was to fall back on the Visiting Forces Act from 1933. This was initially designed to allow soldiers from the Commonwealth, like, like the Canadians, to station military like the forces in Britain I love it. without transferring their jurisdiction to the British authorities. Expanding on this law, they created the Allied Forces Act, which now legitimized the exiled governments as AFA. well to keep their own forces stationed in Great Britain, right? This was important because the Polish, Czechoslovakian, and French governments did not want their forces to simply be assimilated into the Royal Air Force. It also started a bureaucratic nightmare. The Commonwealth soldiers did have it easier. The Canadian pilots of Squadron 401 had arrived June 21st, 1940. That's why I didn't like about Pearl Harbor, the fact that the guy jumped from, like, jumped into the air, like, the British Air Force and was commanded by Air Force. Like, that, like, that, this is what he's talking about. That wouldn't have happened. A month before, the British skies were darkened by streams of German bombers. 
Squadron 401 had been originally established as the first fighter squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1937. Although they had their most experience flying outdated Armstrong Whitworth Siskins, they had Jeez. just recently been upgraded with more modern Hawker Hurricanes. Now, the Hurricanes were slower and not as agile as, say, the BF-109 or the Spitfire, but they were easier aircraft to master. Squadron 401's main task was to engage and shoot down German bombers, mainly Dornier 17s and Heinkel 111s, and leave the dogfights with the Messerschmitts to the faster Spitfire squadrons, right? Although the 401 was mostly spared the political bickering, they still had to train and to upgrade their planes by British standards. Their baptism of fire came in late August as they met the full force of a German bomber attack head on. The Canadians pounced on the bombers, but dogfights with the German destroyers were tearing holes in their formations. The 401, known as the Rams, repeatedly fought to exhaustion. <laughs> Every aerial victory was hard fought, and the Canadians were willing to make great sacrifices to protect Britain's skies. I didn't know that. I honestly did not know Canadians even fought in World War II. The fighting did not stop the political scheming behind the scenes, of course. For the Royal Air Force, it was clear that any pilot serving in a British uniform, irrespective of his nationality, would have to serve under the same military code as the British pilots. The exiled governments, however, wanted to be recognized as actual allies, not just associated powers or foreign volunteers. The independence of their pilots gave them not only political prestige, but legitimacy in representing their occupied home country. If any pilots were sick of those political wheelings and dealings, though, it had to be the Czechs and the Slovaks. Since the Munich Agreement and the consequent invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1939, those men had been forced to flee their country and seek refuge in neighboring countries until they made it to France. But the French did not exactly welcome them with open arms. Instead, they forced many... I apologize, guys, that I don't pause the history channel that much i'm just soaking in all this information so this one might you guys just might be have watched this already so i don't have much opinions on these so i do apologize but um it'll be a less a least paused video <laughs> many of the czech and slovak soldiers to either join the foreign legion in africa or be sent back over the border only a few had the chance to fly some outdated aircraft during the Battle of France, before more than 4,000 of them made it over to Britain. There, under the guidance of President Edouard Benes and Foreign Minister Jan Masaryk, they had their own fighter and their own bomber squadrons established as part of the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve by mid-July 1940. But still, many of them felt that they were again being held back. Lots of British officials initially had little faith in them and treated them as an amateurish, low-ranking force. They trained and reorganized until the middle of August, while the skies of southern England were fought over ever more viciously. When Squadron 310 was given a chance, it quickly proved its value. They began fighting their own private war against the Germans, actually, often going so far as to pursue them back over the channel. Huh. Their determination quickly earned them a reputation as reckless daredevils, but every time they tore into the German formations, they produced results. Soon, the Czechoslovakian insignia was proudly painted on the wings of huh, their planes, that's cool. and their red lion graced the fuselage. Respect was hard earned. Every German plane shot down, every medal won, and every daring exploit of their fighter and bomber crews was documented and featured in their own newspapers and newsreels. This was to bolster morale and to show their critics the value of their commitment. By the end of the battle, no one doubted them any longer. Their 37 confirmed kills and many more damaged enemy bombers earned them the recognition of the top brass. That's cool. There's a lot of stuff I do not, I did not know. I didn't realize that, um, that there were like refugees per se fighting with France and Britain. Like the Czechs and Slovaks, the Polish really cool. refugees had been treated with suspicion and discrimination by officials. Polish General Zayats had gone personally to Winston Churchill to tell him 
that the Polish fighter pilots were eager to give the Germans some payback and that their maintenance personnel were already familiar with British-made airplane engines. But the RAF judged the Polish temperament as too individualistic and problematic. You know, though, most of the exiled pilots from Poland were experienced veterans of the 111th and 112th Escadra of the Polish Air Force, and many had seen action in the skies over Warsaw in September 1939. Serving for the British, Fighter Squadron 303 was less of a new formation and more of a symbolic continuation of their own Air Force. Nonetheless, the men of 303 had to be introduced to new technical details like, like modern throttles and speed propellers and even retractable undercarriages. The PZL P-11s they had flown before were actually closer to a World War I plane than the modern Messerschmitts they now had to face in combat. They adapted quickly. When a German 110 was shot down during a simple training flight, the British were convinced that 303 was ready. <laughs> Throughout September and October 1940, the squadron repeatedly clashed with the Luftwaffe, contesting British airspace with every sortie, and the Germans had to pay a high price for every Polish fighter they shot down. During the German attack on the London docks, the 303 alone claimed 12 Dorniers in one day. That's Flying really good. for the 303, the Czech Josef Frantisek, nicknamed the Lone Wolf, became the highest scoring Allied pilot of the Battle of Britain with 17 confirmed kills. The squadron continued to aggressively attack the Germans in dogfights over London, making 303 one of the highest scoring squadrons of 1940. By late October, the danger of imminent invasion seemed to be over, at least for the time being as the British Air Force finally gained the upper That's hand. That's cool to have that night And many British like officials agreed that had it not been for the foreign pilots, the outcome might not have been the same. Indeed, one-fifth of the Royal Air Force did not come from the British Isles. Next to the Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, and Canadians fought free Frenchmen, New Zealanders, Norwegians, and volunteers from the United States. But although the Battle of Britain was won, the war was far I'll have to look into that on my free time. I am I was like 90% positive that the United States didn't send pilots over. I thought we sent equipment. I didn't realize we actually sent personnel. I'm curious on that. Are from over. So the pilots in exile would continue fighting with the RAF until they were relieved of their duties at the end of the war. Over the war years, the British would also put quite a large amount of money and resources into cultural and educational programs for the foreigners. Since they did not just fight the same enemy, fly the same planes, and eat the same British cuisine, but also lived in British communities, they were to be integrated as much as possible. Learning the English language was the first and most important step. And once they understood more than just military orders, the foreign pilots were no longer confined to their own groups. These educational programs did a lot to overcome initial resentment and kept morale high so that the men felt comfortable serving and living in Britain. Winning the war was only possible if they worked together, despite their political and cultural differences. With time, they grew fond of each other as respect was earned and sacrifices were made. Everybody lost friends and everybody had to get on with the fight until the job was done. Today, Many different veteran associations still remember the Battle of Britain as the defining moment of the Allied war effort. British monuments still speak That's of their deeds crazy. and emphasize how much they had to thank their own and the foreign pilots alike who came to their aid in their darkest hour. For them, never was so much owed by so many to so few. That's a good. Inf that's a lot of information. I mean, that's. I do apologize. I'm not talking as much during these, but I'm just absorbing all this information. It's a lot of good information. Before we talk a little bit about the song, there is a game about Aces in Exile. Yes. Yeah. And it's, tell us about it's that a little bit. Coming here soon, so we can play it in another episode. But you don't have one with you. No. Okay, but we'll play it uh, another episode. It's a couple of years ago, but we were there at the premiere of it, and it was uh, kind of coincidencing with uh, the idea of our song, and then... So, what's game. the game called? Board game. Board game. Okay, okay. Oh. Is it for two players, four players, you know, different amount? Or? You're two people. So it's really one side 
against the others. Yes. About the song. Um, huh. That's cool. You know, it's interesting, I'll check that out. Uh, the Aces and Exiles. Now, we've obviously talked about the, the the Poles and the Czechs and Canadians and so forth many times in the regular World War II uh, episodes on my World War II in real time channel. And they often <laughs> get overlooked and forgotten, you know? Yeah, that's why a lot of people in uh, these countries really wanted us to write a song about it because they are like, oh, uh, Britain takes all the credit for, for the Battle of Britain. Yeah. We, we also have... Um, of course, in the song, uh, which deals mainly with uh, with Czech, which is far from the fame. But this specific song itself Just did uh, that one. was written way earlier than that. Yeah, It's from the 2010 album Code of Arms. It was one of the last songs written for the album. And I remember how long we were working with it because it has so many different elements in it. It was a very inspiring song to work with musically. Actually, a lot of the parts that were written for that song as well were so damn good, so they were used in other songs yeah, later. Okay. I guess if you <laughs> ask anybody of the band members, like, what's your favorite song from Code of Arms? It's Ace and Exile it's for Ace most Exile. people. And, and when Tommy uh, joined the band, he was like, can we play Ace and Exile, okay, please, yeah, please, 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 please? Uh, it's his uh, <laughs> favorite album and it's his favorite it's song. song. I, I think the song would fit into any Sabaton set list at any time. It sticks out, it's something the, very uplifting, very cheerful, very um, heroic, very happy song. So I'm sure that at some point we're going to bring it back. Well, it's interesting that you say it's uplifting mm. and, and heroic, because it is, but those men, especially like the Eastern Europeans and stuff, they were not treated, even at that time. I mean, we say, oh, they're overlooked and forgotten today, and they are less and less, but they still are to an extent when people talk about the Battle of Britain. But some of them were not treated especially well even at the time, you know? I, uh, no, obviously. And uh, I guess that's why a lot of people also, you know, please, Sabaton, can you tell our story because, or can you tell their story because nobody else did to not be allowed in the victory uh, parade and stuff even after that's Although, crazy there are some there are some really good like little i don't know if sabaton has done a song about this or if they would uh but there's a movie called wind talkers with nicholas cage and it's about the book referred to as i think wind talkers or code talkers or something like that um it's about the here in the united states we have a lot of indian populations like um uh, native american indian population and one of them is uh, Navajo. Um, and in the United States, uh, during World War II, we used Navajo code talkers in the Pacific um, because the Japanese could not break the code because they never heard the language before. And it was considered classified. So the soldiers, the Navajo soldiers who participated in World War II weren't allowed to discuss it, and it didn't become public until like the mid-90s. And so all these soldiers did heroic things during World War II and none of them received medals none of them were able to get recognition up until the mid 90s and most of them got it post humorous um, but there's an awesome book I think the book is called Wind Talkers as well it might be called Code Talkers I have the book see yeah I had the book I have the book I read it Code Talker um, this, is, this is an excellent World War II book and if anyone wants to check it out, I would highly suggest it. Um, anyways, so it's crazy to think that during World War II, we didn't honor every single heroic men and women who participated in those battles. To me, that's just super sad um, that we just never did that for them. Like I mentioned before, I'm really patriotic here in the United States. I appreciate the men and women of our armed forces, our police, our policemen and women, our firemen, men and women. Um, emergency personnel etc so it's just it's crazy to think that we never honored um them correctly well personal stories from them that I, a couple i mentioned in the world war ii thing like um there was a a, a polish pilot and he uh, parachuted out right uh, over britain and he landed in a british tennis club right and so <laughs> they they cleaned him up put him in new clothes checked him in as a guest and, and he played tennis, you know, <laughs> and he won, too. And I, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, and there's another, uh, there was another story, a Polish guy, he parachuted out, and he got stuck in a tree. And the locals came, this was way in the countryside, with actual pitchforks, and they thought he was German, because he obviously wasn't. Uh, and, and, he, and his thought, he said, he said so, so I said, I said, in the best, best British accent I could, fuck off. And they go, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, he, he's not German. <laughs> 
So there's uh, a lot of those little little stories like awesome. that. Awesome. So yeah. there are those stories of heroism, and of course, the bulk That's of so the funny. people are well aware of the role that any of those Canadians, Czechs, Poles, all the others played. In a That's so it's funny. Nice that it's getting more and more attention, particularly thanks to guys like you mm. today. There, there was a movie created about the 303rd not not long ago, okay. um, and a pretty well produced movie. Yeah. And I was in What's contact the movie with called? them, and hoping that they would feature our song somehow. Yeah. But this shines a light. I mean, there are so many people often talking about, oh, Sabaton, your music is perfect for having s soundtracks of movies, and we see that a lot of uh, people use our music for YouTube videos where they like borrow uh, yeah. the material from different movies and then they add our music and create their own videos we love it it's really cool and uh, and i think it's a awkward a great thing when they people do that i told these movie makers like if you do not like agree that we do this together like we produce something yeah. and if we don't do it fans will do it yeah, yeah. Uh, and we, none of us will have the profit Great or benefit from it. The problem with the movies is that there is always like this music producer. Yeah. And he has his vision. This is what the music is going to sound like in his movie. And then he suggests something for, for that person. And they are not absolutely not interested in hearing. But I don't give up. So maybe one day, Greyhound. Maybe one day they we need to get Sabaton our music, uh, and Greyhound. Any hey, producers out there, just remember, Per, who's written a lot of songs about things like or World War II, World War One, war, more war, peace occasionally, international <laughs> peacekeeping forces. Uh -huh, uh -huh. See, I got that in, didn't I? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay, well, to all you young producers and old producers out there, that is it for today for Sabaton History. Thank you, and see you soon again. Next week. So that was a great great video a lot of historical stuff involved thank in that thank you everybody for watching and thank you everybody so, for supporting. these aren't clickable and also don't do it click the bell subscribe and become a patron thank you very much <laughs> oh but yeah that was really fun thank you guys again for tuning in and joining me uh part two will be up on a sunday like i mentioned on my video on friday i need your suggestions let me know in the comment section your top five uh, videos of my reactions and I'm going to put them into a list on Monday um, my top five favorite Sabaton songs basically of the songs that I've done so far so let me know otherwise guys you have a wonderful day great evening great weekend stay safe peace